התחלנו. אוקיי, so wait a minute, I see. רק אני אגיד להוסט, תודה רבה, thank you. So good morning everybody, I'm very happy to be with you again. I took a quick glance at the schedule and I understand that I'll be two weeks from now again, but only in a different time. Um, at any rate, uh, the, the topic I decided to speak about today is, uh, you know, um, uh, after I was busy with it in the beginning of the Corona, thinking that probably everybody spoke about it and then we won't have to speak about it again. But here we are, we're, uh, um, we have the challenge of the second wave uh, and um, hoping that there won't be a third wave. And uh, therefore, I decided that it's still appropriate to speak about the topic that I want to speak with you about. And the topic that I want to speak with you about is um, um, the topic, uh, by the way, uh, the host again, now someone came in and I, I pressed down admit. Uh, so I don't know, uh, maybe because I'm the co-host. At any rate, uh, going back to our topic, I want to, so what I want to speak about today is what I call national pikuach nefesh, okay? National pikuach nefesh, which is, one can argue, is the situation that we're in, right? Uh, with the corona. It's, a, it's not only an individual threat. I mean, each one of us, uh, each one of the, people in the world is in risk, yeah? But uh, also there are, I think that there's some uh, national uh, uh, challenges uh, like, uh, you know, the economy and uh, it, it, it is, it, it's not only on the Yahid, it's also on the Klau, on the Tzibur, okay? Uh, which brings the question, uh, what is, uh, are, there, are there different criteria for uh, on the national level. Let me just explain the question, and but in order to understand, um, in order to understand, the, in order to understand the uh, the question fully, uh, let's um, let's now uh, uh, understand first the 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 the, the very basic source of pikuach nefesh. So I'll share with you the screen, and we'll start. Uh, just as I'll say uh, generally, there is, of course, something that is called, there is something that is called pikuach nefesh in the private level, okay? Meaning, let's say I'm, uh, I, I, uh, we're, there's no corona, there is normal life, and then uh, someone all of a sudden uh, is ill, uh, and uh, there is a, a risk for life, then we all know the Allah is that we violate Shabbos even. Shabbos is extremely important, but still we, the Allah is that we violate Shabbos and we, um, uh, in order to give treatment to this uh, uh, man, okay, a very, very common situation is a Yoledet, right? A, a woman needs to give birth. So we say we'll even drive a car, we'll do everything that is needed in order that that um, woman that is now uh, supposed to give birth uh, will come in time for the hospital. And even though there is Shabbos, even though there is Yom Kippur. Okay, what is the source for that? For what I call individual pikuach nefesh. So here I'll share with you the screen. You see, <clears throat> maybe I'll make the letters, you know, now when I'm not handing sheets. So we don't, there's no, no issue of, uh, you know, saving uh, paper. <laughs> so I don't think there is a problem to make the letters bigger. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, did I make the letters bigger for y'all too? I mean, did it work? Is it shared now in big letters? Okay, good. So the source is in Yoma. The Gemara in Yoma has, is a big sugi about pikuach nefesh. And let's read. Amar Rabmatya ben Harash. Rab Matya ben Harash said, Achoshesh Bigono, one who has a, a sore throat, Matilim lo sam betoch piv b'Shabbat, you give him some medication in Shabbat, and the assumption here is that this giving of, of medication involves a violation of Shabbat, even the Oraita, Mipnei shehu safek nefashot, v'kol safek nefashot dochet ha-Shabbat. Okay. I'll digress a little bit and I'll explain. The, 
The Gemara and Yoma that I didn't bring in here, because that's only like a background, it's not directly our topic, but the Gemara and Yoma gave several sources for the din, the known din, that Pikuach Nefesh overrides uh, the mitzvot. And specifically, is Doche Shabbos. Uh, for instance, there is uh, uh, a, a verse that we learned from, Chalel Alav Shabbat Achat, Bishvil Shishmor Shabbatot Arbe, Yeh Mechalele Amot Yuma. And some learn from Mila, all kinds of sources. But then the Morayim says that, say there, that the best source is Vachai Bahim. There is a, a verse not specifically regarding Shabbos, but regarding all the mitzvot in general. And this verse is saying, these are the mitzvot that one should do, and he shall live by them. Now, the pshat of the pasuk has a different meaning, but the drasha that Chazal do, Meaning that the mitzvot should not cause any. Oh, I see that I, I brought, I think, the wrong sheet. One second. Oh, just bear with me one more second, and I'll see if. Um, That's the sheet that was distributed. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, so good. So we'll, we'll stick with that. Uh, maybe, 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 we may, maybe, maybe, let me, yeah, no, it's the right sheet. Thank you, Paul. It is the right sheet. Okay, it was a different version, but I see now it's the updated version. Okay, good. So at any rate, there is a verse says, Bahai bahem veloshi amud uh, The sages infer veloshi amud that mitzvot should not cause any sakana, any risk for life, mitzvot. So because of that, this is true, the Gemara infers even regarding, here, the word that I'm putting here, uh, uh, that safek nefashot. Not only that pikuach nefesh overrides Shabbos and all the mitzvot, even safek nefashot, a doubt, meaning even if there is a risk, even there is not a 100% probability that you're at life's risk, even if there is a, a, a chance, a suffix, nefashot, you violate Shabbos or go over or eat uh, non-kosher and uh, because there is a suffix, nefashot. And the Gemara goes on to illustrate the point. Mishinaf, that's a famous source. Let's read it. Mishinaf l'alav mapolet. One, that a whole, uh, uh, let's say a building fell on him. A whole mapolet, a whole uh, pack of stones. Uh, he's now buried under it. And now we don't know what's with him. Safek husham, safek enosham. We don't know even if there's any human being there. We don't know if he's there or not. Safek chai, safek met. Maybe he's already dead. Maybe we will pile, yeah, violate Shabbos and dig through the, the, the pile of stones. Yeah, bring electricity, you know, and, and uh, a manof, you know, uh, something, all kinds of uh, uh, instruments, yeah, equipment to take off all the stones, uh, it, it, it definitely violating Shabbos, even the right of Havara, and it will end up at the end that will clarify all this pile of stones that no one is there. So we have a doubt here. We don't know if he's there. We don't know if he's, maybe we'll find someone, but we'll find a dead person there. And it turned out that he was dead even when we started it. Safek Kuti, Safek Israel. We don't know if he's a Jew. Mefakhin alav et hagal. The ruling is that even though it's a suffix pikuach nefesh, it's not a vadai pikuach nefesh, it's a suffix pikuach nefesh, even though we are violating Shabbos for this. Now, this is a very important halacha. And here, I stopped sharing for a second. Here, the question is the following. Since we know, since we know that the law is that not only do we uh, violate Shabbos for a definite pikuach nefesh, but we're also violating Shabbos even for a suffix pikuach nefesh. If this is the situation, then uh, what do I really care about what I call national pikuach nefesh? If it doesn't have any meaning, this concept, any distinct meaning, national pikuach nefesh. After all, even for a Suffolk pikuach nefesh, even for the individual, I violate Shabbos. 
Let me even explicate a little bit more and clarify the question. This is part of a more general question. If the, the domain, the topic, the tchum, yeah, the domain, the area of what we call Hilchot Medina, the laws on the national level, is there any different halachas on the national level than on the individual level? One might say, no, there is no distinct different area of halacha, different category of Hilchot Medina. Halacha is halacha for Jews. Let's say you have a concept of pikuach nefesh for individuals, and you apply it when there are many people, like the Medina. But it's the Medina doesn't have really, it's not a different category in terms of all kinds of halachos. Or perhaps it's different. And here one can claim, why do you need to make a different category for a discussion of pikuach nefesh regarding on the national level? Uh, perhaps the minute that I know that there is this, that even a suffolk pikuach nefesh regarding the individual violates Shabbos, then I have already enough halachic tools and I don't need to create a new category. The question will be clarified more as we proceed. But in order, but, but I just want, I want to see first regarding the individual level, I want to show here another important source that is in the end of the source sheet, Davka. Okay, that, this is a source that my Rebbe Ravamital was quoting many times, and I'll explain you soon why. Here, I'll make the letters much bigger. It's a toast photo, two pages later. Omer Ri. Ri, as you know, was the great grandson of Rashi. Yeah, Ri was the great grandson of Rashi. Ri. And Ri says the following The Hainu Tama, the Enul Chin Bekipuach Nefesh Achar Harov. This is the reason why we don't follow majority ruling or majority probability regarding pikuach nefesh. Okay, let me explain what he's saying. We, you remember the case that we mentioned in Pegimo, the Gemara that we, we've just seen, that if uh, stones, a building fell, and we're not sure whether there is a, a living person or a not living person there, or Jew or non-Jew, I'm not going into the very sensitive question whether Pikuach Nefesh of Egoi violates Shabbos. Obviously, now the Gemara at this stage assumes that you can violate Shabbos only to save a Jew. I know it's a very hot topic, but we won't get into it now. At any rate, at any rate, Suffolk Pikuach Nefesh, we, say, we saw that we violate Shabbos. Now I'll ask you the following question. Perhaps there is a, there is a yard. And in the yard, there are nine non-Jews and one Jew, okay? Here, I'll for a minute uh, stop the sharing so I'll able, be able to have a dialogue and, and see you. We have a yard, and in the yard, there are nine Jews, nine non-Jews and one Jew. The assumption is, okay, I, I'm just giving you a spoiler. The, halach, the halachists, like Rabbi Moshe Feinstein and more, are saying that the bottom line is that I do violate Shabbos in order to save a non-Jew. But now let's speak in the, in the Gemara of the Tanaim, yeah, in the Tanaim's uh, um, uh, understanding that you violate Shabbos only for, for, to save a life of a Jew, but not to save the life of a non-Jew. Let's just assume that for the discussion, because that's the assumption of the Gemara. Now, we have a yard, and we have nine non-Jews there and one Jew. Okay. Now, the 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 the, the there was a uh, 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 the um, how do you say the, the 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 stones fell, and we know that nine people escaped before. We can't find them now. Nine people escaped, and it fell only on one person. We have no clue whether it's the one Jew that was there or one of the nine non-Jews, okay? Now, in regular criteria of halacha, we have the din of rov, majority. So the probability is very clear. Most chances, actually 90%, most chances is that this pile of stones now on Shabbos is over a non-Jew, because there were nine non-Jews in this yard and only one Jew. 
So if we would apply, uh, you know, when we have spacus, when we have doubts, Rov, majority, is one of the tools how we decide when we have doubt. So the regular rules of Allah will say that we don't violate Shabbos for this. Why? Because we have we, we, the doubt, there's no more doubt. There is a there is a majority that there is a non-Jew there, and therefore we can't violate Shabbos. However, the halacha is that because still there is a 10% that there is a Jew there, there is a 10% that there is a Jew there, the ruling is that we do violate Shabbos, even for a 10%. Uh, if one wants a more politically correct example, let's say we created some doubt that we know that 90% that the person is already dead. Uh, there are experts that know how to measure how the fall was and see how the stones are. They say, look, when we see such a pile, there's 90%. We know that it's, uh, uh, there's 90% that the, the, the person that is under that pile is already dead and only 10% that he's alive. We will violate Chavez for this 10%. Okay, now Tosfos, the Tos, the Re that I started sharing with you, the Re asks, why? Why aren't we following regarding Pikuach Nefesh the, the general concept of the Torah of majority ruling, of the, according to the majority? Why do we say that even for a 10%, we are, uh, we're saying it's still a Suffolk Pikuach Nefesh, and we violate Shabbos for a Suffolk Pikuach Nefesh? Now look at this very, very important statement of the Re. Mishum Dechtiv, Tosfot quotes him, Mishum Dechtiv, Vachai Bahim. Because it's written, Vachai Bahim, Velo Shiyamud Bahim. Shelo Yuchal Avo Beshum Inyan, Lide Mitas Israel. He says that the verse in, in, in Leviticus, the source of this whole thing, says, Eleha Mitzvot, these are the mitzvot that one should do, Vachai Bahim, and he should live by them. What does that mean? It's a special zera sakatov that the one shelo yuchal avo b'shum inyan lidei mitat Israel. That any scenario, any like it, it is a very inclusive thing. Okay, that we even we don't want to take even a ten percent. We don't want any scenario that a mitzvah will be associated. That performing mitzvahs will be associated with the death one should, should cause the, a risk for life. Now, that is a tremendous uh, source by the Tosfos. As you know, there is, uh, Rav Amital said, there is, a, there is a whole set of alachos in terms of what risks can a person take, let's say, for parnasa. Nachon, there is a Gemara in Bava Metzia says that even a, a worker climbs over the tree yeah, and because he climbs over the tree and takes a certain risk over his life, therefore, it's very important that you'll pay him on time. But what do you see from here? That there is a concept of Shomer Petayim Hashem. Yeah, there is uh, many people threw this term into the air, uh, I think in a wrong way in, in the past months. Meaning that uh, one says, okay, you know, we drive cars. That's right. Now, when you drive a car, there is a certain risk to your life. I hate to tell you, but everyone who goes into a car, especially if it drives to Tel Aviv, especially in Israel, okay, and uh, it takes a certain risk uh, to his life. And yet still, the post came are, are saying that it's mutter to take that risk. It's part of our ordinary life, okay? And we're, so there are risks that one is allowed to take for Parnassa, for normal life. Rav Amital claims, based on the Tosfa that I just learned with you, that counterintuitively, you would say that Shabbos is more important than driving to Tel Aviv. That if someone is considered, is not considered a risk for your ordinary life, then you won't be allowed to violate for his Shabbos a, 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 a claiming that it's pikuach nefesh. If you are ready, and many folks can say, if you are ready by your, the, the, the way you conduct your life, if by the way that you conduct your life, you really uh, demonstrate that a certain action is not a risk that you're refraining, you are refraining from taking, then you can't then say, oh, I'm concerned for my life and therefore I will violate Shabbos for the same degree of risk. Ravamital says no. Ravamital says 
we see that there is a special Zera Sakatov of Vachai Bahem. We saw that Tosfot saying that there is a special Zera Sakatov of Vachai Bahem. And that special Zera Sakatov of Vachai Bahem said that even a risk that you're maybe taking when you're taking a hike or when you're definitely when for your Parnassa, definitely for your Parnassa, such a risk still you'll be allowed to violate a mitzvah in order not to enter such a risk. Because v'chaibahem, there's a certain, certain sanctity to the mitzvahs that the mitzvahs, we don't want them to be associated with life. Now you understand that this has a lot of implications regarding our situation. Let's say tefillah b'minyan, Talmud Torah, uh, 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 learning Torah, tefillah b'minyan, all of these things are actions of mitzvahs. And according to the Tosfot, we shouldn't take even a little, a little risk. Yeah, even a little risk should not be associated with this mitzvah. Uh, I'm saying my words in an abbreviated way. Anyone who understands what I'm referring to is welcome to do this on his own. Meaning uh, uh, the criteria here in Tosfot is very, very clear. Everything that has to do with performance of mitzvot, you should, it should not be involved even in a small risk. Okay, and, and as Rav Amital uh, uh, emphasizes, even a smaller risk, even a smaller risk than an ordinary life. Even, even uh, okay, now, still, and here is a little reservation, even this, and Rav Amital would admit to that, or concede, even this has a limit, meaning one can speak even of small, 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 tiny, tiny risks. No one, look, let's say there's no corona, okay? There's no corona. Baruch Hashem, Hashem saved the world and we're back to normal. Do you all walk to shul on Shabbat? I walk to shul on Shabbat. <laughs> if I won't walk to shul, I'll be fired. I'm the rabbi of the shul. So I'm walking to the shul, to Shabbos. Uh, but you know, there are cars on the street it's true that in Ramot Bet now there are fewer cars on Shabbat, but still there are here and there, there are cars. Uh, is there a tiny risk by me going out, uh, uh, crossing streets in the way to my show? There is a tiny risk, a very, very tiny risk. Will I say, okay, so I'm not going to show? That seems absurd. Meaning even Rav Amital's claim that the criteria, the probability of risk regarding mitzvot is even smaller, lower than the criteria, let's say, for ordinary life, what you're allowed to do and you're not considered violating the nishmartem, meaning even if I say that the criteria for violating Shabbos, eating not kosher, whatever it is, is even a smaller risk, a smaller probability of risk is enough already to allow me, to allow me to violate the mitzvah, perhaps even to obligate me. Even if I say that, that also has a limit. That's for sure. <laughs> because in everything, there is a tiny risk. I'll illustrate to you this point so it will be clearer. I had a discussion. And by the way, the, the source sheet is very big. I wasn't planning to finish it. So no one should be nervous by the, the fact that we won't go follow all the source sheets. Actually, there are only three, four sources that are the main things there. Let me explain. There is a lady that I respect a lot. That is, she's both a doctor, a physician, and a Talmidat Chacham. She's a well-learned lady. Her name is Rebbe, uh, uh, um, Rebbe Mrs., whatever, Dr. Chana Adler Lazarovich. Chana Adler Lazarovich, uh, anyone who knows Rabbi Aaron Adler, fall, former Rav in Ramot Aleph in Traeger, before my time, but he was, uh, he left like a year before I came to remote bed. Uh, so Rabbi Aaron Adler, currently the Rav of uh, Ol Nechama. So Rabbi Aaron Adler has a, has a daughter, his, her daughter, his daughter is called Dr. Rebetzin, Dr. Chana Adler Lezerovich. She's a big Talmud Chacham, she's a Talmud Chacham and also a, a physician. Now she, supports the psaq of Rabbi Rabinowitz, Zechur Tzadik Lebracha. She supports his psaq, 
and actually Rabbi Yisrael Yaakov Fisher's psak from the Badatz, Zechret Tzadik Levrocha, they claim, look at the following claim. And, and it's important, even though it's not in the source sheet, it's more important than the sources in the sheet. So let me just share with you this thing. There is a halacha that says that pregnant ladies, it's a statement in the Gemara and Psachim, and it was ruled in the Shulchan Aruch, that pregnant ladies, pregnant ladies are fasting on Yom Kippur and are fasting on Tisha B'av. That's the halacha of the Shulchan Aruch. And let me even uh, sharpen this. In Tisha B'av, every chole, even a chole that has no risk of life, but he's just defined as a sick person. I don't know, he, he needs to lie down. He can't, uh, he wouldn't go to work. He needs to lie down. So any person who is ill in Tisha B'av, even if this illness is clearly not a life-risking illness, if he is defined as an ill person, as opposed to stamp a weak person from the fast, you know, everyone in 5 p.m. is weak from the fast. But an ill person, even if this illness is not involving risk for life, a life risk, is exempt from Tisha B'av. And yet still, the Allah says that pregnant ladies are fasting on Tisha B'av just like they fast on Yom Kippur. Unless, of course, there's a complication with the pregnancy. This is the simple line of Allah. That's how the Shulchan Aruch is paskin based on the Gemara. And indeed, me and Rav Melamed and many other rabbis, if the pregnancy is a, a, a pregnancy that doesn't have any complications, what we're ruling for pregnant ladies is, there are no complications, is to start the fast on Tisha B'Av and Yom Kippur, to start the fast, if there is a problem, if she's concerned there is a risk, she could drink, but if not, she's completing the fast. My wife completed fasts, other ladies completed fasts, a lot of ladies completed fasts on, based on this. Rabbi Rabinowitz and Rabbi Israel Yaakov Fisher say no, even though the halacha says that clearly. Now research shows that uh, uh, lay, uh, uh, women, at least in Eretz Israel, if they fast and they give the delivery, they give birth, Earlier, there's a certain risk. And that, well, like, now we know, they claim, that there is a certain little risk. And therefore, everyone uh, should drink. Even though the halacha says the opposite. But since now we think, Rabbi Rabinowitz thinks, that it's pikuach nefesh, so they should drink. And Dr. Chana Lazarovich, Dr. Chana Lazarovich supports this psaq. Why did she support this psaq? There was some research done in Be'er Sheva and Ben-Gurion. She lives in Yerucham uh, regarding Bedouim and others that showed that indeed there was some effect of the fasting uh, to making the birth a little earlier. Ah, usually these births that are a little earlier are absolutely fine. No, but still it's not the ideal, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. I had a discussion with her. That was years ago. And I said to her, uh, first of all, she agreed. Uh, and many people said that that research is very, very problematic, has a very, very low validity, scientific validity, a very, very problematic uh, research specifically, but that's a different story. Meaning, actually, there is no definite research saying anything. But I told her, look, the fact that you found a tiny risk doesn't necessarily mean that the halacha changes. Did it pass the threshold of, you know, as I said, there is a risk when I'm going out of my house, not in Corona times, when I'm going out of my house to show on Chavez, a car might hit me. When I'm going innocently, innocently to the show on Chavez, on a regular Chavez, not Corona time, a car might hit me. No one will tell me you should not go to show because maybe, maybe, maybe a car will hit you. That's absurd, okay? So uh, I told her, look, it's not enough just that you'll show me that there is a tiny risk if a lady fasts. The, the question is whether that tiny risk passes a certain threshold. And I agree with Rav Amital that the threshold is pretty low regarding mitzvah. It's true. It's even lower than what is allowed to you in your ordinary life, as I explained. 
There is a special gzeras hakatov of v'chai bahem v'lo shiemut bahem, and therefore the threshold is low. Uh, it, it, after passing passing that threshold, it's already defined suffolk pikuach nefesh, and we're allowed to violate mitzvah for it. But still, there is a threshold for sure. There is a certain threshold. We won't be absurd here in every uh, uh, one uh, uh, epsilon one millionth probability of risk. We will say you're exempt from. You know, we can say the following thing. I told her, I can make the argument that fasting on Tisha B'av, You know, Tisha B'av is summer, is hot in Israel. For every Jew, even a 20 year old healthy 20 year old Jew, fasting on Tisha B'av in Israel is a certain risk. I can make that argument. A tiny risk. It's not healthy 25 hours not to eat and not to drink during the summer for every person in the world. It's a tiny, tiny risk. So will we say that Tisha B'av is canceled because there is a tiny risk? No one will say that. Hannah will the Dr. Khanna will agree with me that no one will say such an absurd argument. What did I prove from this argument? I did there this is a too absurd. That there is a, th a certain threshold, even regarding mitzvahs. Okay. Now let's discuss the following question. We're getting to our topic, believe it or not. Will the threshold, will the definition of suffolk pikuach nefesh, what is already defined as a suffolk of a risk that allows me, perhaps obligates me to violate Shabbos or to violate mitzvot, is the threshold different when I'm speaking on the individual level or on the national level? Will something that I won't define as, as Suffolk Pikuach Nefesh, if I'll do, make a discussion on the individual level, I'll say that's not, that's, that's absurd to define this as a Suffolk Pikuach Nefesh. It's a very low probability. But if the discussion is on the national level, I will say, oh, that's already a suffix pikuach nefesh, and I won't do the mitzvah. You understand my question? Will, will the threshold be different? What do you guys think about this question? You could open your mics and tell me your opinions. Will the criteria to be defined as a suffix pikuach nefesh be different, a lower criteria, yeah, in terms of probability of risk? Will the criteria to be defined pikuach tzapek, pikuach nefesh, will be lower on the national level than on the individual level? What do you say? What's your spar? I, I wrote it on the Rav Kanai. I wrote it on chat that in the midbar they didn't they didn't have brit milah because of the suffix of the danger to the children. That's true. That's that the is national true. level. It was on the national level. Why do you think it was on the national level and not you see it as the individual? Each one that had a bris, it was a risk for him. Why do you call that a national level? Because it was uh, adopted by whole of Ami Israel in the Midbar. Yeah, but it, each, it was adopted each one when he was born. Uh, uh, do you think that was out of a decision of a national consideration or in the, or the individual? It was, a, it was a min, min hagamakom. It was the exact no, exact I understand exact. that was a mina, but you could say min hagamakom about everything. It's a min hagamakom to, 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 lane, to make tour laning. The question is, uh, 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 it, first of all, you might be right, Paul. I'll, I'll return to what you say, and we'll see if that's individual or national. Okay, I'll, I, 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 If I'll forget, remind me to get back to the example of the mila. But here I repeat the question. Uh, what do you think? Should the criteria of what is defined pikuach nefesh? How much of a risk is already defined pikuach nefesh? Should this criteria be different if we're discussing individuals, an individual case, or if we discuss a national, uh, uh, a national event or a national occurrence? Hello. Hello. Yes, shalom. I yes. think it should. I think it should be lower because it has to cover all the different possibilities of people who are more frail, uh, older, Very sicker. nice. Very nice. We'll see what you say in one of the, one of the rabbis claim it. We'll see. Uh, any, uh, 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 what's your name, please? Excuse me? I'm Nechama Langenauer. Nechama. So Yishar Koach Nechama. We'll see that I think, Rav, I believe Rav Israeli goes in your direction. Any other? ideas, a different yeah, I idea. Think, I think that uh, 
there's definitely an added layer because from an epi epidemiology point of view, what happens uh, uh, with regard in, in terms of the, a, a community uh, will have an effect on the individual that's greater than right. the individual alone. So therefore, there seems that it might be logical that there would be a different uh, 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 a different approach uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, taking the epidemiology of the situation. Fantastic. So Harold and Nechama, I believe, are saying the same thing, pretty much the same thing. Let me phrase it in my words. Of course, Harold and Nechama are welcome to correct me if I didn't uh, present their opinions accurately. What I understood from what Harold and Nechama said is the following very, very plausible argument. When I'm talking about a large quantity of people, community, by the way, it's not necessarily national. It should just be a big sum of individuals, something that affect, that is potentially affecting a big sum of individuals. When I'm dealing with such a case, then mala asot, the probability that will cause a danger will cause damage to one of these individuals is much bigger when a certain threat affects only an individual. Meaning there could be a certain thing that if I, that, that for a specific average individual is not a risk or not enough of a risk that we'll all cancel a mitzvah for it. However, when it is, when this threat is facing a large quantity of individuals, then the probability that one of them is more vulnerable is big. And therefore, I already enter the threshold of Suffolk Pikuach Nefesh. I just want to say that conceptually here, we're still in the thinking of individuals, not of national. However, what we're saying when you're discussing things on the national and the communal level, when there is a big amount of people, automatically the probability that there is a risk for a certain individual, there is a big risk, okay? Let's see, let's see uh, this thing in the sources, with uh, this argument that was said uh, uh, by Harold and Nechama, let's see it in the sources. And then I'll show you a different logic of Rabbi Orbach. Okay, let's go to the source of the very basic source regarding pikuach nefesh on the national level or on the common. Here you'll see not necessarily common, but many amounts of many individuals, okay? Let's see. The Gemara in Shabbos Membet says the following. You see this source, the source in Gemara Shabbos Membet. The Gemara says the following. The Ha'amar Shmuel, Shmuel said, there is a certain gechalim. How would you translate the word gechalim, Paul? Gechalim? Cold. Cold. Yeah, that's what I thought. I, I need more uh, self-confidence here. Cold. Uh, so there is a coal of metal, a metal coal. And that metal coal is somewhere in Rishusa Rabin, in the street. So you say you extinguish it. So that uh, uh, many, the public, the people that go there won't be damaged by it. Now, kibui is a malacha deraita to extinguish that coal, that metal coal. Now, the assumption here that it's not a risk of life, I, I, I mean, for an individual. An individual that touches this coal an individual that touches this coal, uh, what, what happens to an individual that touches this coal? It's very not pleasant. He gets a little burn in his finger or in his leg if he kicked it, but it's not a life threat. That's the assumption. And yet still, the Gemara says that one should extinguish it because the, the many, the public, the many could be damaged by it. So look at what Nachmanides there in his interpretation, Rambam, interpretation for Masechet Shabbos, look at what he says, look at his comment regarding the matter. He says the following, 
Rashi interpreted, Perish Rashi, that why is that allowed? Because this, in our sugya, we're not talking about a malacha doraita. It's merely rabbinic. Rashi, in order to solve the problem that I raised, how come one is allowed to extinguish this metal gachelet? It's not a pikuach nefesh. So no, no, he says here, extinguishing it was only a rabbinic iser. It's a malacha shinat rechalagufa. It, it, it is not considered their raita. And when there is a damage, a nezek, and a damage to the many, then the rabbis didn't uh, 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 hold their zera. Now, so that's Rashi's approach. So Rashi's approach that we were talking only about a rabbinic malacha, Rashi's uh, interpretation to the sugya is not relevant for us, for our discussion. However, look at now at Nachmanides. However, it says Nachmanides, in Halachot Gedolot, who is Halachot Gedolot? Halachot Gedolot is Rabbi Shimon Kaira. He's one of the Geonim. He's in the era of the Geonim. So the Halachot Gedolot, he says, Rashi says, I found in the Halachot Gedolot that he says, a coal made out of wood, a wooden coal, there is no damage to the public. Why is that? Because uh, um, uh, people are seeing it. A wooden coal, you see that it's burning, and therefore people are careful from it, and therefore they won't bump into it. Even though it is a potential danger because it doesn't always, it's not always red. And um, Yeah, and he says, therefore, he says, I can't say Rashi's interpretation. Therefore, he oh, says, yeah. I must say that we violate it because of pikuach nefesh, okay? We violate it because of pikuach nefesh. Now, look at this important lines of the Rambam. And the Rach agrees oh, with, okay. the, with the halachos gedolot. The Rach agrees with the halachos gedolot. Now, the Ramban concludes, v'teimahu. He says, this is a, it's a question here. It's a question here. Teimahu. Eich anu matirim melacha gmura mishum heizek shelo bimkom sakanat nefashot. Look at this sentence. Ramban says, I don't understand how a melacha doraita is allowed only because of damage and if there is no risk of life. He says, how come we allow to violate Shabbos the right to extinguish this uh, coal, metal coal, a malacha the right, and there is no pikuach nefesh here. There's no fire, no one is at life uh, 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 threat. So he says, and here is the, maybe I'll put these letters in bold. The Shema, perhaps, says Ramban, kol hezek shel rabim. Here we see explicitly in the Rishonim that the criteria for a big amount of people, a Rishut Harabim, is different than the individual level, that the discussion is different. There is a this different level. Perhaps every damage of many, of Rabim, is considered Sakanat Nefashot, yeah, Maybe, perhaps they say every damage, Ramban says, call Hezek Rabim, Shmuel holds that it's Sakanat Nefashot. Rabbi Israeli applied this regarding the halacha question of operating a police in a Jewish state. As you know, the police are doing a lot of stuff on a routine basis in every modern Western country, and not only modern Western country, police are doing things not all of them are pikuach nefesh. Not every patrol is necessarily pikuach nefesh. Not everything, okay, chasing after a ganav is not necessarily pikuach nefesh. So will we decide that in the Jewish state, when there are Jewish policemen, we are limiting substantially the activity of a police on Shabbos? So look at what Rabbi Israeli says based on the Gemara, Based on this sentence of the Ramban, it says, why do we extinguish a metal coal 
uh, even though it's not a pikuach nefesh when I'm discussing it in the individual level. Yeah, a metal coal is not a pikuach nefesh on the individual level. If there is an individual in his home, there is a metal coal, uh, uh, he's not allowed to extinguish it. He should just be careful not to touch it. And even if he'll touch it, he will only get a little burn. It won't be pikuach nefesh. But if it is in the street, then we extinguish it because Heizek Shel Rabim is considered Sakanat Nefashot. Why is that? Look at Rav Yisraeli's explanation. And here, the explanation of Rav Yisraeli to the Ramban is exactly what Nechama and Harold said. Near A. I'll read, look, I'll, I'll, you'll follow me in the Hebrew, but I'll translate it immediately to English, okay? So anyone who wants to follow the Hebrew is welcome, but I won't read every sentence in Hebrew. It seems, says Rav Yisraeli, that the foundation of the things is that everything that has to do with the uh, 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 peace of the public to the common, to the uh, ordinary life the, um, of, a, of a public or, or uh, removing a potential uh, damage from the public, all is considered pikuach nefesh. Because everything that is involved in the welfare, in, in the shalom, yeah, in the peaceful life of the public, indirectly has to do with pikuach nefesh. And here, Rav Israeli illustrates the point. If we're talking about the parnasa, a threat to the parnasa, but of only one individual, not like what we have now in Corona, that it's a national economical threat. Uh, let's say there is a certain uh, 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 threat to the parnasa of an individual, okay? Doesn't have pikuach nefesh. It's not considered yet pikuach nefesh unless he's starving. But if the tzibur, if the entire public will have no parnasa, even if it doesn't have to do to bread, then it must be that one of these many people needs medically a better food. And for him, this better food must be pikuach nefesh. Meaning, if an individual can, tells me, look, I need to do an avera in order that I'll have more than bread. If I'll keep the mitzvah, the only thing I'll earn is to have bread in my home. If an individual asks me such a question, then I give him the very tough answer and I'm telling him, look, you need to work only to earn bread because one can li live with bread, okay? That's this specific individual and most of the individuals. However, if the same thing applies to a large quantity of people, like Harold the Nechama said, then one of these many individuals is definitely a person that bread is not enough for him. Therefore, if there is a certain scenario that there is an economic uh, uh, threat to a lot of individuals and that economic threat will cause them to earn only bread. So for the individual, I would have said, uh, no, uh, I can't help you. You need not to violate Allah and earn only bread. But if this thing encounters a large quantity of people, that since one of them definitely needs more than bread medically, and for him, if you'll have only bread, it will be pikuach nefesh. Therefore, that will violate the mitzvah. And here it continues, another argument. Rabbi Israeli uh, 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 deals with the question, how come there is a heter to go to a milchemet reshut? Milchemet mitzvah, I understand. It's a milchemet mitzvah, but milchemet reshut, how come you're allowed to go to an optional war if there is a risk for life or people? But he says, if the war causes economic growth that enables to take care, to cure more sick people, and, and before that, the, the economic uh, uh, situations before that war are terrible, and uh, therefore I can't give treat to all these uh, ill people, uh, and a war that is in order to cause people a, a, a deterrence uh, a, and, and therefore people want to make treaties with this land by this war and by that you improve the national health. That is the heter. And then he says, Here, now he comes to our Sylvia. The same is the explanation to our Gemara of the heter to remove the damage by that metal coal. The metal coal on itself is not dangerous for an individual, for an average individual. 
But it's possible that that individual that will be harmed by that metal coal, not killed, but harmed, he won't be able to go to work after it. He'll become handicapped. I don't know. And maybe he's also a very individual, old person, uh, an isolated person, but dead, alone, a lonely person. <laughs> And he won't be able to come to go to come to a person that will help him. And this will bring him to Pikuach Nefesh. Meaning, he says, a metal coal, a metal coal for an individual, an average individual in his home, is not a life threat. And one is not allowed to extinguish it on Chavez. However, if it's in the street, then since uh, thousands of people pass in the street, then of course one of them is a very old person will be substantially damaged by that coal and won't be have, maybe won't have people to help him and it will cause him pikuach nefesh. Or perhaps one of the persons that will uh, uh, bump into that coal, he will become, uh, uh, he's vulnerable and he'll become handicapped and then he'll lose his parnasa and then will starve to death. Meaning, because it's on the street and there are many people, just as Nacham and Harold said, that the, then the probabilities here change because for an average person, indeed, it's a, it, it, it's not enough of a probability to be defined as pikuach nefesh for an average person. We know that it's not a risk. But when we're when it's located in the middle of the street, then we're concerned that one of the the many people that pass in the street for him it will be pikuach nefesh. And therefore, he says, and the same he says regarding all kinds of scenarios, that if we think it about the individual, it's a far scenario that one should not be concerned by it. However, if we speak, if we discuss it from a public perspective, then at the end, this probability will happen. And therefore, uh, the argument of pikuach nefesh holds. So you see, my friends, that the svar of Harold and Nechama, the svar of Harold and Nechama appeared explicitly in Rav Israeli's words, explanation to the Ramban's explanation to the Rishonim, the Gaonim, that explained that one is allowed to extinguish a metal coal on Shabbos when it's on the street, even though if this metal coal would have been located in a private home, we won't be, we won't, we wouldn't have been allowed to extinguish it. But the minute that it, we're discussing it in the public, from a public perspective, when it's in the public location. And we're concerned that one of the individuals, for him, it's going to be pikuach nefesh, and therefore it's already a suffolk pikuach nefesh, and we violate Shabbos for it. I just want to clarify. I think I was saying something slightly different, uh, if I can just clarify it. What yes, I'm please. saying is that uh, an individual risk, you know, let's just talk about disease, they have a certain individual risk. However, right when there is an epidemic or a pandemic and a large number of people in the community have, the, have that problem, then that increases everybody's individual risk. So when, okay. the, so, which I think is something slightly different. You're it's right. Like now my individual risk was X, but now that- the, Very good, you're it, right. It is, now, it, my individual risk is now higher than fantastic harold i agree with you it's a little it's a slightly different argument yeah let me i, I, I thank you harold for clarifying it it's an important clarification nechamas and rav uh, and rav israeli's argument is exactly as i explained the minute there is a large quantity of people that are uh, exposed to a certain uh, uh danger to a certain thing then even though that thing for the average person is not a risk if there's a large quantity of people, the probability that one of them, for him, it's a big risk, is 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 already big, and therefore it's already uh, uh, passed passes the threshold of pikuach nefesh and will extinguish the, the metal coal. That's what Rabbi Israeli uh, uh, used the, this argument in order to justify, let's say, that the police will remove all kinds of damages because they can potentially be pikuach nefesh for a certain individual, even though for most individuals they are not. Okay. What Harold is saying is different. He says the minute that there are many people have the pandemic, many people are ill, then the risk for every individual increases. Okay, that's 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 a different argument, an important one. I'll just say uh, that if we'll take Rav Israeli's argument, not Harold's argument, okay, 
but just if there is a, a certain uh, 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 um, uh, thing that is a potential risk for, indiv for an individual, for a regular individual, it's not a life-threatening risk, but uh, if uh, many people are exposed to it, then uh, for one of them, it will be uh, a life risk. Of course, we can apply this argument also to our corona easily. Yeah, meaning perhaps let's say that uh, uh, this uh, corona thing, perhaps I'm not saying that that's true. Even if one says that for individuals, uh, for every individual, it's a small risk, but there are definitely, uh, when, when, when something is a pandemic, it's not just an individual mahala, then since it, it, many people are exposed to it, among these many people, there are definitely a quantity of high-risk people, okay? And for them, it's a life-threatening thing. Okay. So Rav Israeli's uh, argument is easily applied to uh, our situation. Now let's see a different way of logic regarding a very important one. And it's important not to mix up Rav Israeli's argument and the argument that we'll see, we'll see now of Rav Shloim Zalman Orbach. So let's look at what Rav Shloim Zalman Orbach answers here in a fascinating answer. Rabbi Farbstein brings in the name of Rav Orbach the following uh, uh, thing. Okay, look at the Shaila. Hashoel Ayah Yeah, the, the, the person who asked the question was a, a, a guy that served in intelligence. He was a, a soldier in intelligence. And they were able to, uh, uh, they, they uh, um, identified uh, 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 a certain uh, communication network of, a, of an enemy state, meaning uh, great. They are now listening. They're able to listen to all the communications of, uh, let's say, the army of, uh, of a state that is uh, against us. And they were able to, and they were able to um, break the code, OK, uh, to, um, to break the code of that uh, communication, secret communication network of the enemy state. The role of that soldier was to uh, how will you translate this? To, um, to translate the code with a computer, meaning there was a computer program that let's say he would input uh, uh, the statements that he heard there with the code and the, the, the computer would translate it to, uh, 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 we'll figure out what it means. Now, of course, this whole process was Chil Shabbos, yeah? To, to take the statements that said in the code in that enemy uh, country and to operate it so that it, what, the code will be broken and, and, and to explain the statements. That was in, involving, of course, with all the computer and everything, a violation of Shabbos. So his claim to his commanders was that in Shabbos, when he's there on Shabbos, he wants only to break only to, to work with only part of these uh, um, communications, only those that he could see that they have big probability that they have to do with Israel. Meaning, let me explain the question. He had an ability, this network included tons of information. Now, the vast majority of these uh, communications were the vast majority of these communications were not relevant for Israel even. I don't know, it was uh, different people that are talking about their shopping in uh, uh, Iraq. I don't know, wherever it was. And, and the vast majority of the communications after you uh, uh, translated, broke the code and translated them to, to, to regular Hebrew, the vast majority of these messages were totally not relevant to Israel. So he says, I could see what seems in a high probability that it might have a uh, 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 any connection to Israel. And only these on Shabbos, only these I will uh, work on. Because he did have an ability to know what has more chances that has to do with Israel. And there were things that the, the chances that they have to do with Israel were extremely low. Okay. What do you think Rav Oyerbach answered him? What should he do? Should he actually 
work on all the messages, including those that the probability that they have to do with Israel are extremely low, or you should do what he says, that only the ones that have some, that it seems that have Nakia uh, to Israel, only the, only these he should um, uh, work on. What do you think? Anyone wants to speak should uh, open his mic. There may be some uh, case of it being a secret code. It's codes. It's codes. It might be relevant. There might be a small chance that hidden within it is some message that will be important to Israel. You wouldn't know. It's a, there's a slight chance of it. Yes, most of it. It's like it's like an FBI wire, wire tap. It's the same thing. Any little bit they're checking for, they keep t testing it only till they get to the one piece of the pearl within that's found in the sand. And that might what might be what we may need to save the country. Right. Though the, the, the one that asked the question did it have a certain way to assess. He didn't say, I won't do anything on Chavez. He said, I will work on the messages that at first appearance seems to me that they might have a, a certain idea to Israel because I know from experience, let's say that the messages that are brought in uh, nine o'clock in the morning they usually have nothing to do with Israel. They only deal with uh, shopping. It's not that he said, I won't do anything on Chavez. He just said, let me differentiate between the things that there is that, that seem to have in the to Israel and things that don't seem to have in the to Israel. But, but they, but they might you not. you said you may never know. You still said you may never know. Yeah. Yeah. But, yes. they, but they might not. In other words, he may miss one. I, I so, don't. I, right. he, I, okay, I don't, he may miss one. Yes, uh, Phil? I see. I don't think that the guy will be announcing his topic. Now I will be talking about Shabbos different matters. Oh, it's like, Yanko, come here and take the phone. It's an impossible question, assuming that intelligence is in an area where there is some significant possibility of important information. So it's a question, again, of a small bit, but of information that could be very valuable to Pikuach Nefesh of Jews. Uh, or a political statement about the weather in whatever town this guy is at the other end of. It, it's, it's almost an impossible task. Let, let me explain. It, it, all of what you said is true, but I, 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 I'll explicate, explicate even more the question. The assumption, is, the assumption is that some of these messages, okay, and, and some of these messages, and he has a way to know it according to the time they're given or whatever. The probability that it's Bikuach Nefesh is so, so low that if he would have... No, Hevre, please let me... Okay. Hevre. The, the, uh, we have uh, nine more minutes, so let's uh, finish this argument. Uh, all of what you said is true, and I'll use it, okay? And let me explain. Just we need to sharpen the question. The assumption is that some of these messages and the soldier that asked the question had a certain way to, to know them. The probability that they have to do with Pikuach Nefesh is so, so low that probably if we would have done, uh, discussed it on the individual level, nothing, no one would have allowed him to violate Chavez to this very, 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 very low risk. It's like crossing the street on the way to Shul. And look what Rav Shlomo Zalman and Arbach answered, just like you all answered, that even if this thing is in the level of, as I said, crossing the street in the way to Shul, Look at what Reb Shlomo Zayim and Orbach says. Nigashnu yachad lagon Reb Shlomo Zayim and Lishon lechavat atoni, and he ruled that the soldier is obligated to work on all the messages, even though there is no difference regarding pikuach nefesh of individuals and many, and even on a suffolk pikuach nefesh uh, of an individual, we violate Shabbos. But we there is a difference as to what is the threshold, what is the percentage of risk. For example, people are, are driving from Tel Aviv to Yerushalayim. 
even though there is a certain risk, let's say of one to 10,000, but there is no doubt that these are individuals take that risk for the life. But there is no doubt that a prime minister that will take a one to 1,000 risk on his, on his state will be considered as a non-responsible prime minister. Because regarding the public, this is defined as a sakana. Therefore, Rabbi Orbach ruled that the soldier must uh, 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 work on translate all the messages because all of them might have something regarding the national security, even though that risk would have been, would not have been considered a risk regarding an individual. Meaning, let me expl expl explicate and clarify. And what Rav Orbach saying, is saying here is different than what Rabbi Israeli said. It's not a machloikis, but it's just a different argument and a different perspective. Anyone who learned here probability will understand what I'm saying, especially the term in statistics called expected value. People know what is expected value. Anyone who worked in insurance knows that. Yeah? Meaning, I'll return to that, but let me explain. Here, we're not talking like Rav Israeli that when many people are exposed to a certain thing, then the probability is that one of them will, let's say, develop a system, one vulnerable one. That's not the argument we're saying now. What we're saying now is the following. Let's say there's a certain little risk. Let's say, as I said, crossing the street and the way to show. There is a very, very low probability that a car will hit me. I didn't recognize it. He, he, he zoomed from the corner, hit me and killed me. I will still walk to the shul. What will happen if that's one to one, one ten thousandths or one millionth probability will happen? A terrible thing will happen. I'll be dead. However, if there is a risk to a country, to a seaboard, to a public of one to millionth, the same risk as crossing the street, okay? It's little, little risk. But now it applies to, it's a risk over a state. Then the cost, if it happens, that's terrible. That's a destruction of Klal Israel or of an entire state, of all the Jewish state. If the Jewish state loses a war because that soldier missed a certain... Um, information because he didn't violate Shabbos. If he loses as, uh, uh, if he misses the pearl, as uh, Phil or Jake said, that pearl that indeed there is a tiny probability that that pearl is there. There is a tiny probability that the pearl is there. It's true. But they, they usually these messages are about shopping. Okay? And the guy knows that usually these messages are about shopping. But there is a small chance that the pearl is there. It's such a small chance that it wouldn't allow me as an individual. It's equivalent to the risk of crossing the street in the way to show. But if Kaspashal and Makar will hit me, then I will be killed, but only me. But if I'll miss that pearl, if I'll miss that pearl, then the whole state of Israel will lose a war. That's... Uh, a tremendous loss, a tremendous cost. Th therefore, this is already defined as pikuach nefesh, meaning, translating in terms of expected value, for those who it will help them, but I'll say it in normal English. When I calculate what is already passing the sh threshold of pikuach nefesh, what is already defined as suffer pikuach nefesh, I need two pieces of information, says Rashon Izamaru, not only one. Not only what is the extent of the risk. That's only one. What is the probability of the risk? One to 10,000, one to million. That's one piece of information. But the second relevant piece of information to decide whether it's suffix because is if that one to million thing happens, what will be the loss? What will be the cost? What will be the price? If the price is a life of individual, that's very sad, but that's totally different than if the price 
is the loss of a country or, or a big amount of individuals. Okay? So this argument is different than Rabbi Israeli. And this argument is also relevant to what? To the corona, yes. I believe. Because what do we say here? The threat here, if let's say the whole economy collapses, the whole, uh, the whole uh, hospital uh, 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 system, medical system collapses, the, the cost here is much greater than the cost of a loss of life of an individual. So the discussion here of pikuach nefesh on the national level is different than pikuach nefesh in the individual level. Because I must take into consideration the scenario, even of a low probability, but the scenario of what happens if that low probability indeed happens. The cost will be much higher, okay? If I'll get back to the Brit Mila example of Paul, perhaps the decision not to make Brit Mila in the Midbar, okay, it could be of either of these arguments of uh, Maybe it was a risk for every individual, so therefore the discussion is not even relevant to our topic, meaning the probability of a risk for each average individual was already high to begin with. But let's say no. Let's say it wasn't that high. But it was enough that one of the many individuals in the midbar would be risked. Here, by the way, I can say no. So regarding each baby, you should assess, but maybe it's unknown, okay? So here I'll apply Rav Eli's argument, or perhaps, um, no, uh, uh, Rav Orbach argument, it's only if, um, no, Rav, Rav Orbach's arg argument, I think here it's a little harder to apply. Also, Harold's uh, uh, argument, I think, is harder to apply in the case of Brit Mila. Rav Israeli's argument, perhaps, is possible, and maybe I even don't need it. Maybe it was just to begin with a risk for every average individual in the Midbar. Okay, so in sum, anyone has a comment? And, and now is the time to make a comment. And if not, I'll just wrap it up. I, I just have one comment. I think in one of the Shiorim of Torah and Sion, there was a discussion about an Air Force pilot, and he doesn't know whether he's gonna hit the target or if the target is there, does he have a responsibility? And what is the risk of to human life if he, you know, he's in a war situation and then he has to let the bombs go? Okay, I think it was a question in the American uh, army and it was discussed in one of, I don't remember the answer, that's the only Right, problem. but I, I think here, again, let's make a distinction between risk to, risk to us and risk to enemies, uh, 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 which is already a different, it's a wonderful topic. I mean, how much I should be careful about lives of innocent uh, civilians of uh, enemy countries. I have a shear on it, we'll see. Uh, uh, but uh, the, um, I, I wanna hear, summarize, uh, Mamash in one, in two minutes, I can some package all, all this shear, okay? We started with a statement about the fact that even on the individual level, and not only pikuach nefesh overrides the mitzvot, even a suffolk pikuach nefesh, overrides the mitzvot, and not only that, even a relatively low probability overrides of a risk, overrides the mitzvot. As I quoted to you, it's a special Zerat HaKatuv, as Tosfos, the re says, of Bahai Bahem, mitzvot should be associated with life. There, are sanct there is a sanctity of mitzvot that they should be associated with life and not cause uh, 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 life dangers. However, as I said, of course, that also, this argument also has a limit, yeah? Won't go to the absurd. You know, breathing air uh, is a certain, not even in Corona time, breathing air is a certain risk. Crossing the street is a certain risk. We won't say that one should refrain from doing a mitzvah if it involves crossing a street, okay? So, of course, there is a, third, a certain threshold. And here the question was whether the threshold is different regarding individuals or regarding uh, 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 public, uh, national. And here we've seen three, uh, uh, two approaches, and then I'll add Harold's uh, specific argument for uh, the corona. But what we've seen, Rabbi Israeli, based on the Gemara and Masechet Shabbos about the metal coal, 
that is defined pikuach nefesh only when it's in the street, not when it's in the private home. He said, look, the minute that there is a certain uh, um, damn, a, a risk potential thing that is placed, located in the street, then many people are exposed to it. So even though for the average person, it's not a risk and not enough of a risk to violate Shabbos for, but if there are many people passing by that uh, uh, danger, then definitely you, uh, uh, one of them, it will be involving a pikuach nefesh and therefore we extinguish that coal. So that's, and I said, this kind of argument has a relevance for Corona, yeah? Uh, even if Question on the risk, what? Question on the Corona situation, that you, you sort of hinted at it. The Haredi position is that if we, Close down to save those lives. We are we wiping out the Torah. Okay, that, that uh, that's a great thing, and I won't go into it now. It depends also which Haredi group. It depends on a lot of, of variables. Course. I don't want to, um, but I I I want to. So here the the and I know some Haredi make that argument. They believe that there will be a, a spiritual destruction. Uh, the Hasidim will be gone. Whatever. Uh, there we we can we can. Uh, we, here, there are all kinds of arguments back and forth regarding this. I'm just saying, again, national pikuach nefesh. A, I could look from it from a perspective. The minute that the risk, that many people are exposed to it, the probability that one of them will be vulnerable is big. And therefore, even though for the average individual, this is not considered pikuach nefesh, when it's located in the public domain, then it's already defined pikuach nefesh. Therefore, the threshold is lower. B, a different argument is, of course, uh, Rabbi Orbach's argument, which is, uh, I think, fascinating. Uh, Rabbi Orbach is saying, look, I should, when I decide what is defined suffix pikuach nefesh, I should look at two pieces of information, like every insurance company. I should look both on the probability, how low it is and how high it is, but also on the cost, on, 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 on the loss. If that uh, uh, low probability materializes, what will be the, 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 the loss? Here he says, you can't compare an individual loss, how matter tragic it is, okay, to a, a threat to the entire country. And he gives the example. The risk that every person takes in his individual life, like driving to Tel Aviv, every, every, every individual, most individuals take that risk, but a prime minister that will take the same probability of risk to regarding national security will be considered not responsible, okay? So therefore, Again, the threshold should be much lower regarding uh, when we discuss on a national level, because the cost, the cost is, is, is uh, if that low probability materializes, will be very big. Harold added that the minute that there are a lot, specifically regarding pandemic, the minute that many, many individuals have pandemic, uh, then the risk for each individual is now already much higher than usual. It affects the, the, the degree of the, 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 actually the probability. Okay. And we'll see you again in two weeks, but in a different time in 1040 and 1030.